Hello, my name is Jess. Welcome back to my channel. We are back for another video essay. Yes, this is not going to stop happening. I miss the days of toiling over an open word document in hopes of impressing whatever literature teacher I care about the most that semester. I'm never going back to school though, so this instead. <laughs> This one is a little bit near and dear to my heart. It's also a little bit controversial. I'm really hoping I don't get yelled at for it. So, you know, please don't yell at me. And also I have quite a bit to say about this topic. You've seen the title of the video. I am gonna talk about fandom conservatism as well as the rise in anti-shipping. So if that triggers you in any way, shape or form, just letting you know right now, I'm going to talk about some things throughout this video that I am probably going to put trigger warnings for here before I really get into it. Some of these things, while they might seem silly to an outsider, oftentimes are very intense, very emotional, and very upsetting for those of us in the fandom community. So keep that in mind. This might just not be the video for you if that's something that really triggers you. I would prefer if you took care of yourself rather than watched my video. But before I get too far into it, if you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you like my content, please consider subscribing to my channel. And if you really love my content and you think it is the best thing on the internet, you can hit the bell icon to get notified every single time that I post. We'll see if I am able to do this all in one shot. There might be some costume changes. Honestly, this is a really long script. I am just going to let you guys know this is going to be a long video. I will try to break it up in the little bar down below. So if there's just certain parts that you care about, you can only watch that part. I know this might not appeal to everyone in my ADHD audience. So this is going to be very different from a lot of that content. I appreciate anyone who watches this video all the way to the end. With all of that out of the way, I guess I'm gonna get started. Anyway, we're gonna be talking today about something very near and dear to my heart, which is fandom and fandom communities. I have been involved in fanish communities pretty much since the early aughts. If you really wanna hear my credentials, I remember browsing individually curated archives of Inuyasha fan art. And when I first discovered fan fiction, fic still didn't have proper content warnings. So fic with sex in it was called the lime. Actually it was called the lemon, but like I only had a lime. Yes, I had way too much unsupervised access to the internet when I was a kid. Therefore, my first introduction to pornography was actually fan fiction. Back when fic was titled this way, a lot of times you found out that uh, Lemon meant there was sex in a fic by just reading it. So, and that's how you, you know, learned that that's what that meant. Anyway, part one, what is shipping and a brief history? Shipping can be as simple as liking two characters together aesthetically and as complex as the push and pull relationship that happens when a hero falls in love with a villain. And it can be as silly as these two characters have never interacted, but they both like pancakes, so I think they should be together. And yes, one of my favorite ships in high school was based on a brief non-canon interaction in which both characters discussed liking pancakes with each other. I'm not gonna say which one, but if you can figure it out, comment it down below and you'll get, I guess, some kind of clout from me, because that's all I can offer you. Also, don't at me for being very involved in that fandom. I was young. Anyway, I'm not gonna delve too much further into what shipping actually is, because honestly, I think it's been kind of talked about at length on YouTube. And also there's great resources on fanlore.org. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I will link that down below. 10 out of 10 would recommend fanlore for any of your fan history related stuff. Generally, the only places you can find it are curated archives, not touched by ads. Unsurprising. Now, a quick history of shipping within fandom. Shipping started in fandom as early as Jane Austen deciding she could write a better romance than... Oh, wait, no, this is a different video. I'm gonna use a different example. Shipping started in fanfiction as early as people watching Star Trek, the original series, and then holding up in their rooms to write Kirk Uhura or Kirk and Spock fan fiction. Shipping has often been the muse for many a fan writers and fan artists throughout the years. It's one of the most driving forces behind large fandom communities such as the Merlin fandom, the Sherlock fandom, the Supernatural fandom. I almost said Super Hulak instead of Supernatural. Many of the major fandoms throughout history have involved some form of shipping and the people who tended to write fan fiction or draw fan art tended to be largely cishet women or queer people. I myself am a longtime fan fiction writer, especially romantic pairing fan fiction, so shipping fiction. And honestly, I credit fan fiction with where I am as a writer today. 
both in my fiction writing in addition to my professional writing. Writing fan fiction is a great way to just strictly practice writing. So honestly, it has done wonders for me throughout the years and I'm really thankful for that, which is why as I go through this, you'll see I might get really emotional. So hopefully that does not happen. I'm not a crier, but I do get emotional. If my voice breaks, I'm sorry, I'm also sick. Shipping has also been one of the main causes of drama in fandom. So even from back in the 1970s when the original Star Wars trilogy was being released, people were arguing over whether or not Luke and Leia, or Leia and Han Solo, were going to get together in the next movie. Which is actually a really great example of what I want to talk about in this video, which is how shipping leads to fandom drama, and how fandom in recent years has moved from arguing over whether or not two characters should get a happily ever after together, to a question of morality and mass harassment campaigns. It's time to talk about anti-shippers. Now, in my opinion, the first inklings of what an anti-shipper would ultimately come to mean and what ultimately antis tended to do has existed since the early aughts. If you've seen the Ballad of Miss Scribe video from the lovely Eldena double cast? double cat, you're going to have some good context for what I'm about to talk about. If you haven't, I would highly recommend giving it a watch. It's a really great video and it's well researched. I'll drop it in the description down below for you guys. A basic rundown of what happened with Miss Scribe, just so you guys have a bit of a reminder, is that she garnered sympathy and support from some popular Harry Potter fanfiction authors by creating sock puppet accounts to bully herself. One of the ways she did this was using early anti-shipping traits. I'm just gonna straight up read this part to you guys, I think, because it's a lot, and it's a lot about Harry Potter fanfiction, and I was not part of this community, so it's hard for me to do this. Give me a break. Okay. <sighs> See, in the Harry Potter fandom, during the three-year gap between the release of Goblet of Fire and Order of the Phoenix, a huge ship war broke out between Harry Hermione shippers and Harry Ginny shippers. This caused a schism in the fanfiction archives because, at the time, sites like fanfiction.net and Archive of Our Own, which centralized fanfiction, didn't really exist yet. Instead, fanfiction was hosted on various archives, which were created by basically anyone who decided to moderate an archive. For example, one of the results of this ship war was the creation of a heavily moderated archive made primarily by and for Harry slash Ginny shippers, which only allowed three ships and had an emphasis on canon. Which is just, come on guys, one of the ships you allowed was Rima Sirius, and where's the fun in shipping with an emphasis on canon, but different strokes for different folks, I guess? On the other hand, an archive was made by a couple of big name fans or BNFs in the Harry Potter fanfiction that allowed pretty much any and all things including Smut. One of these big name fans was Cassandra Clare, who very publicly hated Harry Ginny and even publicly bashed some of the fanfiction from that fandom after she decided she wanted to give it at least one try and asked her followers for recommendations, which like, not a good look, bro. <laughs> anyway, I promise I'm getting to the point here, but at this time, getting to be a big name fan or BNF was pretty hard, unless you were Miss Scribe and you could use lots of sock puppet accounts to bully yourself and garner sympathy for previously mentioned Cassandra Clare, and that is part of the reason that she became a BNF. And yes, I would say the ways in which that Miss Scribe bullied herself on the internet used what I would consider early anti-shipping tactics. These early tactics were essentially overly Christian members of fandom who would kind of get onto anyone who posted anything sexual or homosexual with an emphasis on homosexual and, you know, basically rip the author to shreds and list Bible verses and be like, you're going to hell. It was, it was a mess. I remember seeing it on people's posts and it happened to me at least once when I was still in middle school. But yeah, this this kind of anti, anti shipping type behavior, which was largely utilized by very overtly Christian people in fandom, did exist in the early aughts. And like I said, I did have some experiences with it myself. Weirdly enough, a good number of them in major fandom history turned out to be sock puppet accounts, which is just a super weird coincidence. That doesn't mean all of them were sock puppet accounts, just some of them, just the ones that mattered apparently. But the point of everything that I just told you is basically that this is where we start to see the first tactics that antis would ultimately use and what coalesced, in my opinion, into anti-shipping in the early to mid 2010s, roughly. And now I want you to remember that the roots of this faction of fandom, so anti-shippers, were in 
overly conservative Christian members of fandom, because that's going to be important later. First, I want to talk about where the term anti-shipper actually came from and give you guys some framework of how it became popular and talk a little bit about my actual experiences with anti-shippers and why this matters so much to me. Now, the terms anti-ship and anti-shippers have had different meanings throughout fandom history, and if you look at fanlore.org, it actually originated in the X-Files fandom. Back when X-Files was first airing, the term anti-shipper or anti-ship and no romo, meaning no romance, were actually synonymous and it was largely used to talk about the group of people in the X-Files fandom that simply didn't want Mulder and Scully to have a romantic relationship of any sort. Approximately one a week over the past six weeks. Is there any sign of- Two small puncture wounds on the neck? That's not what I was gonna ask. Too bad, we got him, check it out. During its, like, kind of inception and the first uses of the words, when it was applied to other fandoms outside of the X-Files fandom, it tended to just mean that people, someone who identified as an anti-shipper or was anti-ship, just didn't like whatever really big popular ship of the fandom was. So, like, a good example of this is you would call someone in the super... I almost said Super Hulak again. So you would call anyone in the Supernatural fandom who maybe didn't like Destiel, which was one of the prominent and very popular ships, just anti-ship or anti-shipper. Generally though, that would mean that they didn't want them to be together and they might not want anyone to get into any sort of romantic relationship in the show. It just kind of depended on the person. Since then, it's meant a few different things and, and can mean different things in different contexts. And I think I should say here, especially that when I was doing research for this essay, I just discovered the fact that a lot of, in the last like six months to a year, so like 2020 to early 2021, people have been using just the term anti, like not anti-shipper, but A-N-T-I, to refer to people who are of color, calling out racism in fandom, they would just call them an anti basically to shut down their argument, which is not cool guys if you are using anti in this context, that is one, not what it means, and two, listen to people of color when they talk about, you know, racism in fandom? That's how we fix racism in fandom, we listen to the black indigenous people of color in fandom about where racism turns up in fandom. Don't, just don't do this. If you're doing this, you're wrong. Please don't do this. If someone is calling out racism, they're not an anti. This is not a good use of the term, and if you are a member of fandom doing this, stop. I think it's time for me to talk about my personal experiences with anti-shippers in fandom. So I joined the Voltron Legendary Defender fandom, I think, uh, like a month after the first season of Voltron the Legendary Defender dropped on Netflix. So it was a new series at the time, I was very excited about it, and like every fandom that I get involved in, I got hyper fixated on it, and I was absolutely obsessed. Sorry to all my friends just whenever I have a hyperfixation, frankly. Initially, when I started watching Voltron, I was very invested in the ship Clance, referring to Keith, who pilots the Red Lion, and Lance, who pilots the Blue Lion. Keep in mind, at the very start of the Voltron fandom, we knew zilch about any of these characters. We basically only had what was in the context of the first season, and because of that, there were two predominant ships at the time. One was Clance, and the other one was Sheath, which stood for Shiro and Keith, who piloted the Black and Red Lions. Please note that yes, both Clance and Sheath share a character in that pairing. That is part of the problem, but Keith was involved in both these pairings. And we knew from even the first season that Shiro and Keith knew each other before the events of the series. And you know, I saw artwork for it and I was like, oh, that's nice as well. I just, I didn't really have a preference for one or the other in any distinct way yet. I just kind of preferred Clance because it was a ship dynamic that I generally liked. However, I will say from the start, I did also like Sheath because it was interesting that they knew each other before the start of the series. I'm sorry for anyone who's not in the Voltron fandom who's gonna have to listen to me talk about this. This was pretty normal for me in fandom, uh, just like different people liking different things. I had just admittedly come from the Homestuck fandom where there were a lot of different ships, a lot of different ships that people were very excited about that either got together or didn't. And you know, like I said, just different strokes for different folks. That was the way I saw it. That is until about think it was about right around the release of the second season, so this would have been in January of 2017 roughly, I noticed something kind of off about the fandom. Now, most of this went down on Tumblr just for clarification so you know since it was 2017, this was before 
they banned uh, any and all NSFW content and therefore pretty much most of their user base left. But all of a sudden I started to see posts on Tumblr about how if you shipped sheath you were an in real life pedophile or you were a pedophile apologist and people started sending anonymous asks on Tumblr asking artists and fanfiction writers if they were willing to publicly denounce Sheath, essentially saying like, I think she Sheath is a bad ship and nobody should ship it. Otherwise they would be labeled a pedophile and this just got worse very quick. The name Sheath had actually been coined by Josh Keaton who was the voice actor for Shiro in the series and Sometime right around the end of the second season is when things kind of got buck wild. Like, people sending Josh Keaton death threats and made baseless accusations about him being a threat to his own children buck wild. Yeah, it was bad. Meanwhile, I was over in my corner of Tumblr like, what the fuck is happening? I had never experienced anything like this in a fandom, and it turns out what was happening was... dun dun dun, -dun A ship war. It was Fandom Wank. Also, for anyone who doesn't know, Fandom Wank just means like dumb fandom fights, like ship wars, like arguing which ship is better, that sort of thing. So like I mentioned before, both Sheath and Clance as ships included Keith, the pilot of the Red Lion in the series, and shippers who really, really liked Clance and vehemently hated Sheath because it got in the way of Clance being together, meaning Keith and Lance, found a new way to convince people that they shouldn't ship Sheath which was by attaching morality to it. Interesting play. Let's get into that. Now, remember when I said that at the start of Voltron, uh, especially seasons one and two, we had no more than like a very basic outline of these characters? That's important again. Please keep that in mind as I talk. At some point shortly after the second season dropped, someone disseminated a rumor that Shiro, who flies the Black Lion in the series and was basically just a ray of sunshine himbo for all we knew at this point in the series, was 25, while uh, the rest of the paladins, meaning the other people who pilot the lions, were 16, while Pidge, the only girl on the team, was even younger at 14. This led to some people asking some very leading questions to voice actors, not writers, not showrunners, voice actors, uh, about the ages of the characters at a convention panel, to which they were like, yeah, I think Shiro's probably about 25, that sounds right. It was, it was roughly like that, I've seen the video. I'm not gonna show the video, but I've seen it. However, this caused people to start treating these as fact, even though all of the voice actors pretty much immediately rolled back on it and said, we don't actually know, we're just voice actors, we're not writers, and we're not showrunners. However, this became the first weapon in the anti-sheath arsenal. Now, instead of arguing just that you should ship Clance because it's a better ship, they were arguing that if you ship sheath, you IRL supported pedophilia, so you should ship Clance instead. This was even thrown at me a few times on my fanfiction blog on Tumblr, and I wasn't even really shipping Sheath at the time. I was still largely a writer for the Clance side of this community, and on my fanfiction blog I received an anonymous ask asking if I shipped Sheath, and I responded that it seemed fine, but it really wasn't my cup of tea. However, since I didn't publicly say that Sheath was bad and that it was pedophilia and that nobody should ship it, I got lumped in with all of the people who shipped Sheath and that anti-shippers didn't like. So there's actually a lot to unpack here, especially with some of the insanity that followed these particular uh, events that I just listed out, including one story where a clan shipper took images of one of the series antagonists, Lotor, and was basically holding them hostage, saying that they were going to keep them up on the internet unless the showrunners agreed to canonize Clance. But honestly, some of this is weirdly traumatic for me, and when I started writing this script, I realized that it really wasn't necessary to talk about what I wanted to talk about, so uh... Not gonna unpack that trauma today. So I had actually never been in a fandom experiencing this sort of issue. Like even to an extent, I had never been in a fandom experiencing this large of a ship war. And I have never felt so isolated in a fandom. Frankly, I had written a few posts for the Voltron fandom on Tumblr that were doing like really, really well. But because of that one time that an Anon asked me like whether or not I cared for Sheath, I was receiving uh, accusations of being a pedophile or supporting pedophilia IRL or being okay with maps, which I am not. I guess I need to publicly say that in this video, which was like really upsetting for me for a lot of reasons that I'm not going to get into. But honestly, if I say it out loud, I don't think anyone is going to question why it was upsetting for me. 
But I kind of walked into Voltron and got a few good posts that got a few thousand views and I got a lot of followers out of the Voltron fandom. And I was like really excited to potentially be a big name, big name fan for the first time in a fandom. I was a writer who had been writing fan fiction for a long time that never really did super well. So when things started doing really well for me, I was like, super super excited about it and then all of a sudden it came kind of crashing down around me when it turned into people sending me things like that and honestly it was not nearly as bad for me as it was for a lot of other people especially fan artists and especially people who were openly shipping sheath at the time also i've always kind of been a multi-shipper usually i would have a couple of ships even if they shared characters i would be fine liking and supporting content around them or even creating content around them so i eventually did because i was you know gonna stand my ground i was already on the the, the sheath side so i might as well and honestly it was kind of the better pairing at a certain point in Voltron. They got a lot more character development together, Shiro and Keith did, than Keith and Lance did. So I wrote for Sheath and I ultimately probably liked that a lot more, but I would occasionally get into the Sheath tag and there would just be like, and trigger warning for like blood and gore, I'm not gonna show anything, but I'm just gonna mention it. I would jump into the sheath tag and there would be like gory body horror images that had nothing to do with sheath there that someone had tagged sheath to get back at the sheep shippers i i guess that was their motivation there i don't really know luckily this all kind of went down right around when discord first started getting popular so my response to this was to start a discord server which could be private and i could moderate for people in the voltron fandom who weren't in the anti-shipping category so you know maybe they liked glance maybe they liked sheaf maybe they didn't care about either of them but at least they weren't anti-shippers. And another thing too is, is that I had a friend who was running an Overwatch server that was really, really fun at the time, and I had been in a Voltron server at some point, but I one, found out it was run by anti-shippers, so I wanted to leave it for that reason, because I kind of decided that I did not like them for the things I have listed already in this video. Also, uh, I found very quickly, I was in that server for maybe a couple weeks and most of the people in it were under 18 and I felt uncomfortable with that, so I left it. Which is why I was like, I'm gonna make one that is for people who are over 18 that aren't anti-shippers, where we can kind of congregate and talk to each other without maybe running into kids who are young, just because that's not always what people want in fandom. Anyway, so I already kind of mentioned that Shiro and Keith were getting more character development together than apart and way more than Keith and Lance together. But by the time I think it was the third season happened, it was pretty clear in the show that one, Keith and Allura were kind of the main characters of the ensemble cast of the show. And two, Shira was a very important person in Keith's life and that wasn't going to change. And it was for reasons that happened outside of the series that we didn't know yet. And three, Lance and Keith were not getting a lot of air time together. Then, um, as time went on, obviously Voltron was getting popular. Voltron has always been one of those shows, much like uh, Transformers, that surrounds toy lines and is really focused on the idea of selling action figures to young boys. So it started to get some products outside of the series. At this point, in the collection of all Voltron media, including the things that were not directly related to the show, there was no confirmation that Shiro was 25, there was no confirmation that Keith was 16, or any of the other paladins for that matter, and there was also no confirmation that Paige was 14. And honestly, as far as we could tell at this point, we were probably never going to get that confirmation in the show. The only thing that we did have that was somewhat canon was a description from the original first season, so the pilot season of Voltron, which described the characters as five teens. So we didn't know if that idea that Shiro was like 25 was just some coming from the voice actors or if things changed later in the series, but we were on like season three at this point. And then a book came out. And this book was just a, a collection of information about the characters that talked a little bit about their backstories, who they were, what they cared about, who their favorite animals were. Still very funny that Keith's favorite animal is a hippopotamus. We got that out of this book. However, this book did something very interesting. It did in fact list Shiro as 25. However, it did not list Keith as 16. It listed him as 18. Why does this matter? Because this is when you'd think like, given what people were saying and like anti-shippers had been saying up to this point, it wasn't pedophilia anymore because Keith and Shiro were both adults, right? But no, this is when we really realized that everything was just a ship war and that Clant's anti-shippers were just 
moralizing a ship war. Straight up, it was a ship war that they were applying morality to. And why do we know that? And it's because they didn't stop. So at this point, we have confirmation that Shira is 25, Keith is not 16, he is 18, therefore an adult. And I just want to point out that that would mean Lance in this book is listed as being 16. So how the turntables, <laughs> because now technically by what anti-shippers had been arguing up until this point, Keith and Lance's relationship was no longer healthy. It was therefore also pedophilia. So we now had confirmation that Keith was 18, Shiro was 25, and the aunties just kind of continued to harass sheath shippers despite it no longer meeting their criteria for pedophilia. And thus began one of the most confusing series of arguments I have ever seen in any fandom ever, which ranged from well, a 25-year-old should never date an 18-year-old, that's basically pedophilia too. To, if they knew each other as kids and they grew up together, well then they're adoptive siblings and that's incest. Which, we had no confirmation that they grew up together. They didn't. Keith never gets a last name in the series. We absolutely have no idea if he was related to Shiro at all, and later on found out that he definitely was not. Like I said, th this was happening around season three or four, because that's when this book dropped. So we still didn't know a lot about these characters outside of the fact that Keith was half Galra. That was like the most revelation thing we had learned at this point. So for some reason, this is the direction aunties went in, which, you know, uh, you could talk about there being a potential power imbalance in someone being 25 dating an 18 year old, but in real life, not not in fandom. In, in fandom, it's not quite as relevant because they're not real. But the point is, just admit that you liked Clance better. It's fine. No, no one's gonna be mad at you. It's okay. Now, I haven't talked explicitly up until this point about the harassment that anti-shippers kind of did to sheath shippers, but it straight up drove them off Tumblr. That's not even a joke. Most sheath shippers left Tumblr long before the NSFW ban in, I think, 2018 or 2019, whenever that happened. They left and congregated in other places like private Discord servers or Twitter because Tumblr was no longer a safe space for them to experience the Voltron fandom. The thing is, when it comes to anti-shippers, one of their main tactics was changing the meaning of words. For example, pedophile to an anti-shipper doesn't mean someone who is in real life attracted to prepubescent children. Instead, it meant anyone who shipped a character that was over 18 with a character that was under 18, even if the characters were like 17 and 18. This distortion of the meaning of these words ultimately allowed anti-shippers to dogpile creators that maybe created content that they didn't like, largely pertaining to the ships that they did not like, all while pretending that it was some kind of moral crusade or moral high ground. Remember the Christianity thing? The thing is, it's a lot easier to convince someone that an artist or a writer or a creator of any sort is a bad person if you tell them that they are a pedophile rather than telling them, oh, well, they ship Sheath or Raylo or whatever it is. It's it comes off a lot different. You're getting two very different connotations to that person who maybe does not know a lot about the fandom. But I kind of want to step back from this for a moment now that you kind of know what anti-shipping is and talk about other things which come with anti-shipping because these are important as well. We also need to talk about bad media criticism if we're going to talk about anti-shippers. I think Sarah Zed's video on bad media criticism does a really good job of breaking down why bad faith media criticism ultimately has been really harmful for the literal creation of media, media as a whole. One of the things she focuses on is how bad media criticism has become so pervasive on YouTube it started to seep into and affect how media is actually created. I personally think that this can extend to fandom really well, especially the parts about people taking unwarranted shots at creators based on personal opinion. Something Sarah covers really, really well in her video. I will also link this video down below in the description and, you know, in the cards. I'll put the cards. You especially can't talk about the Voltron fandom without talking about fans outright abusing and defaming creators as well as voice actors who frankly had no control over the story in the first place. One of the ways you'll see this the most is the talk of queer representation in Voltron. Considering the way that the showrunners talked about queer representation and trying to include it in the show, uh, you could tell pretty much that it was a run-of-the-mill situation where they really really wanted to include 
queer representation of some sort in Voltron. However, they were kind of fighting against their corporate overlords to get it done. I think it's fair to give them the benefit of the doubt on this one, that they were trying to include something that would be meaningful and well done, but they were just kind of, like I said, struggling against their corporate overlords who just wanted to sell toys to little boys. That rhymed. Honestly, their first attempt at representation in the show was... Uh, okay, but not great. And it received quite a bit of backlash, which was fair, but also not fair. You see, the show established that Shiro, the person who piloted the Black Lion, had a fiance question mark. It's not clearly stated in the show. They just talked about it in a press panel at one point. The showrunners at one point talked about the fact that they wanted to include scenes with Shiro's fiance earlier and make it more explicit, but because of corporate and executive meddling, they couldn't. And eventually at some point they were told pretty last minute, like, hey, you can include that scene now. So they kind of had to awkwardly shove it in somewhere and it wound up in the seventh season of the show, which is uh, kind of a, in general, I didn't really like that season very much, but that's a different conversation. However, the one scene that Adam was in is actually a breakup scene. Shiro and Adam break up in this scene. It's it's pretty obvious that Adam is saying like, hey, I'm not going to be here for you when you get back because of a lot of stuff that's going on in the series that I'm not going to get into. Where the backlash kind of came from was there's kind of this massive war on Earth while the main characters in the ensemble cast are not there, meaning the people who pilot the lions. During this massive war, Adam ends up dying basically because of military incompetence. Basically they're fa facing a very technologically advanced civilization. They are not as technologically as advanced and despite one of the characters saying you can't send those people out there, they're just going to die, uh, they are sent out anyway. It's not great. Now, I want to say, in my opinion, this was a questionable choice. It does read very barrier gaze, but as a writer, I could understand why they maybe wanted a named character to die in this battle, especially a character that we have now seen interacting very closely with one of the ensemble cast members. However, I think they could have made better choices. That's all I'm gonna say on that. Anti-shippers took this as a very, very obvious bury your gaze. They were like absolutely super convinced that it was bury your gaze, and they totally went after the showrunners about that. Now, the problem with this is, is that even though Adam did die, he was not the only MLM character. That scene where they break up establishes Shiro as an MLM character. Now, I don't speak for MLM people, but at this point, Shiro was confirmed to be gay. Like, we only ever see him with other men. He's, he's gay. He's there. He's there for the rest of the series and live. And the other thing is, is that arguably, this was a breakup scene. They broke up before the events of the series. Even if Adam had survived, there was no indication that Shiro and Adam were going to be together had he not died. So it's not the conventional barrier gaze like the anti-shippers were talking about. Again, I'm going to give the showrunners the benefit of the doubt that this just wound up being clunky because of executive meddling and not because of any intentional, oh yeah, we're gonna kill Adam off. You know, like he, he wasn't expendable because he was queer, if that makes any sense, which is usually the problem with barrier gaze. And also, I just want to say at this point that we have like active, well-documented uh, interviews in which the showrunners talk about the fact that they were originally going to kill Shiro off and decided that he wasn't going to be their representation, meaning he wasn't going to be a gay man because they learned about the barrier gaze trope. So. I, I think they were trying, and there was also confirmation that they did intend for Adam to come back, but because of various cuts and things, it wasn't going to make sense, it was going to be really contrived, so they decided not to do it. Honestly, like, when it really comes down to it, Voltron's production was really, really messed up, and I don't think it excuses anything, but it does explain a lot of things. <laughs> so basically, in my opinion, they didn't get away with this. And the reason I think it's important to talk about it with anti-shippers in particular is because it largely misinterpreted what actually happened in the show. It wasn't really a classic barrier gaze scenario. Also, it seemed kind of like they were kind of calling out this bad thing that happened in the show, this piece of bad media tropes, basically for the sake of their ship war and not for the sake of being like, hey, barrier gaze is 
bad. Though I will say, part of the reason I think anti-shippers in general hated this whole thing with Adam was because this scene really, really developed Shiro and Keith's relationship way further and left sheath shippers so much room to go absolutely ham on the idea of Keith and Shiro getting together once Shiro knows that Adam is dead or Adam has left him. Then the eighth season happened and Shiro was shoved into a clunky, awful marriage at the end of it. He was also sidelined for most of the seventh and eighth season because he was no longer piloting a lion and a lot of other reasons. Listen, the last season of Voltron is bad. Like, if someone asked me, like, hey, should I watch Voltron? I'd be like, yeah, watch up through the seventh season and then just don't watch the eighth. The thing is, is that before uh, Joaquin Dos Santos and Lauren Montgomery, who I've not named up until this point, but they were the showrunners for Voltron, before they said openly, Shiro is a gay man, anti-shippers would often accuse them of queer rating. And so because of this and because of what happened with Adam, they shoved in a very clunky, awful marriage for Shiro, despite the fact that he was very sidelined in the last season and it was not necessary. Yeah, bud. Specifically, they'd accused the showrunners of implying in interviews that Lance was going to be bisexual and that he was going to be in a relationship with Keith. This is despite the fact that in several interviews, they're outright asked about the ship Clance, like, hey, are Keith and Lance ever going to be together romantically? And they would outright say no. They they did not, there, there was no beating around the bush. They would just say no. I don't know why anti-shippers in the Voltron fandom were so attached to this idea. And in fact, the only people we ever see Lance being attracted to in the series are women. On top of this, you would sometimes see arguments that the showrunners were still queer baiting because Lance was not bisexual, even if Shiro was there and he was gay, which doesn't make a lot of sense. The showrunners also very frequently in interviews said that, <laughs> this is kind of funny now in hindsight, they were trying to include some form of queer, queer representation if they could, and that any character who got with another character would have a lot of relationship development and would not just kind of be shoved into a relationship. Either way, my point here is, is that to members of the Voltron fandom who were not anti-shippers, the things that the showrunners were talking about seemed pretty run-of-the-mill to us. They wanted to include queer representation, but they were probably fighting against DreamWorks about it. And which, if you knew anything about anything and how these shows are created and how much influence things like toy sales can have on them, it checked out. It made a lot of sense. However, this did not stop anti-shippers from continuously attacking showrunners for minor nitpicks and errors and the fact that Keith and Lance weren't getting a lot of screen time together or in general the fact that Lance specifically was not getting a lot of screen time, which I will give anti-shippers this one. The very first season of Voltron, especially like the first like four episodes roughly, really make it seem like Lance is going to be a main character, like one of the main characters within the ensemble cast. And he's not, he's not in the rest of the series, unfortunately. And like, I, I'm not like saying that isn't, unfortunately he's like not in the series. He's just really not one of the main characters. The two main characters really at this point we knew were going to be Keith and Allura, especially by the time like season six rolled around. Like you were like, okay, Keith and Allura, they're the main characters within the ensemble cast of characters. I also want to stop here and point out that at this point in the the events of the actual show, Allura and Lance had gotten a lot of like romantic development together. And if you remember, I said that the showrunners kept saying that anyone who gets together in the show were going to have a lot of development. So by season like six or seven roughly, we were like pretty certain that Lance and Allura were going to end up together in some capacity. However, this ship in particular never got as much hate as she did, both I think because by the time it was really becoming like a reality in the show, we were past the point where they were like, nobody knew what these characters' ages were. However, I will say that early on in the series, people thought Allura was like 20 and that Lance was like 16, meaning that this relationship would have also fit the anti-definition of pedophilia. So it is a little bit weird that the straight ship never got any like serious hate and it existed from the very beginning of the show, don't get me wrong, like Lance and Allura were like a pop, a fairly popular ship from fairly early on. So it is a little bit weird that the straight ship never really kind of got any of this hate while the MLM ship did, which is yikes. <sighs> However, I did mention the, the wedding between Shiro and uh, a character that is never named on screen. His name is Curtis. He's never named on screen. They never say his name 
on screen. I just really want to emphasize this. In Project Mayhem, we have no names. No, you listen to me. This is a man, and he has a name, and it's Curtis. Okay. But we, we knew that anti-shippers weren't really there to make good faith criticisms of the series after the eighth season came out and Shira was shoved off in, into this like clunky marriage that didn't make a lot of sense in like this absolutely bad, just uh, on downright bad. What's the word for it? Prologue? Is prologue the word for it? Anyway, epilogue, that's the word for it. But yeah, in this like ultimately like really bad epilogue of the series too, Allura is killed off in the final season. Literally the only black female lead in the series. And really the only female lead in the series? Like, again, of the ensemble cast, Allura and Keith were the main characters, and they killed Allura, the only girl. And more than likely, this was because Allura was Lance's only love interest in the series. Like, yeah, he flirted with other girls, but at that point, like, he was really only interested in being with Allura. So with her out of the picture, they could write as much hurt comfort fic about Keith getting together with Lance as they wanted. The point I'm trying to make here is that in its final season, Voltron made some really bad decisions, some really, really bad representation decisions, things that could have been critiqued in good faith. Like, as I am doing now, Lauren Montgomery and Joaquin Dos Santos, I'm sorry, but why did you kill off your only black female lead? And, you know, meanwhile, a lot of non-anti-shippers, so people who ship Sheath in the Voltron fandom, were just like absolutely appalled by the fact that Allura was dead, and a lot of people accused them of just being mad that Shiro and Keith didn't get together and that Shiro was married off, when in reality, the overwhelming complaint I saw from Sheath shippers was actually about Allura dying. They really thought that a series all about the power of friendship and like, you know, found family and working together to get through the hard times, allowing Allura to basically just sacrifice herself without any of the found family she had created around her, trying to stop her from doing it and trying to find a different solution wasn't a good way to end that series. And I would still say that wasn't a good way to end that series. And the other half of this too was that with anti-shippers, up until this point, they had largely been huge critics of Joaquin Dos Santos and Lauren Montgomery. Sheath shippers were really willing to try and defend them and give them the benefit of the doubt about the queer representation up until this point. Now, all of a sudden, anti-shippers were totally fine with them. They had been doing the greatest things all along. They gave us that good queer rep. Look at that that good that good wedding between Shiro and that unnamed side character. Isn't that wonderful? The first MLM wedding in a cartoon. By the way, nobody talks about it. Because one, it's not in the actual canon of the series, it's in the epilogue. And two, it was not good. It was really contrived and it was against everything the showrunners have been saying up until this point. But suddenly, when there was good faith criticism to be made, anti-shippers were nowhere to make it. My argument here is basically that anti-shippers weaponized bad media criticism throughout the life of Voltron, and then as soon as they saw an opportunity for their ship to get together, suddenly it didn't matter. There was no criticism to be made at all. It was bad. It was a bad look, guys. Now, I could also stop here and talk about the large portion of fandom that convinced themselves that this was like some kind of secret edited version of the final season and that, you know, DreamWorks had stepped in to step to make all these changes and like not give Lotor the redemption arc that he was supposed to get because he was supposed to be the series Zuko and like all this stuff, but honestly, like, this really seemed like it was just a conspiracy theory. Basically, just from what anyone knows about how the animation industry works is that things like this would get cut or moved around, like, in the script writing phase and would definitely not make it all the way to animation. So there's probably no secret eighth season of Voltron. I'm sorry. I know we all want it because there was so much potential in that series. Yeah, I would just recommend not watching the last season of Ultron. If you have not watched it and you are interested in watching it, just watch until the end of season seven and then be like, done. It's, it's, it's actually a good ending point too, which is what's funny about all of this. Anyway. This is just what was going on in the Voltron fandom. A lot of very specific stuff about what was going on in the Voltron fandom because this is the one that I experienced the most. 
At the same time, anti-shippers had begun to pop up in basically every fandom you could possibly think of, from Star Wars with Raylo to the anime fandoms like uh, My Hero Academia, who had anti-shippers for Bakugo and Deku? I'm sorry, I don't watch that series, but I think that's the name of that. I think that's the name of those two characters. <laughs> um, and the breadth of reasons that anti-shippers didn't like ships had kind of you know, grown. It wasn't just pedophilia. Now it was, you can't ship anyone with their bully. You can't ship like Rey and Kylo Ren together. Like Kylo Ren literally tortures her on screen. Like, you know, they, they had a lot of, a lot of different reasons. It kind of depended on what fandom you were in. And like I said, with Voltron particularly, it was the pedophilia thing, which we knew was a moot point by the time that book came out around season three or four. At the same time, anti-shippers had begun to pop up in basically every fandom you could think of, uh, and the groundwork had been laid for years for this. Um, the use of anti-ship tags on Tumblr was really the largest reason that this happened. It allowed people who did not like a certain ship to all gather together and talk about why they didn't like that ship and essentially um, organize, which in normal situations would be a good thing, um, except they used it to harass people, which is not a good thing. You shouldn't harass people. In their initial inception, anti-shipping tags were um, an opportunity for people to talk about why they didn't like a certain ship or a certain ship dynamic without bothering people who did like that ship. So, you know, instead of going into the hashtag sheath on Tumblr, you could go into hashtag anti sheath and talk about why you didn't like that ship. Um, however, at this point, the bothering had finally begun, which led to harassment. Hi, guys. <laughs> Um, this is editing Jesse, I guess you could say. This project got a little bit out of hand. I kept joking about it as I was recording it that this was taking a really long time to record, and I probably should have known then and there that it was probably going to need to be more than one video, otherwise the video was going to be several hours long. So I am here to do an outro to this video and talk about what's gonna come up in the next one for you guys, just to kind of smooth over and explain a little bit about what's going on here. So basically what this video wound up being, and originally this was all one script, so keep that in mind if things seem a little bit funky at the beginning of the next video. But essentially this video was originally going to be about anti-shippers in the Voltron fandom and the rise of fandom conservatism. So now instead, this first video is going to be about anti-shippers, what they are, are in the Voltron fandom specifically, and then the next video is going to be about the rise of fandom conservatism in fandoms in general. I'm still going to talk about Voltron a little bit specifically because like I said this was originally one script. I'm really excited about this. I think this actually turned out really really well and I'm really excited to get into the editing process for the next video but I've got to finish this one first. So this is the end of part one. If you liked this video please consider subscribing to my channel. If you really like my content and you think it's the best thing on the internet, you can hit the bell icon to get notified every single time that I post. Otherwise, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. You can subscribe to me at other places, which I will put on the screen right now. If you follow me on Instagram in particular, sometimes I do ask questions on my story. Also, if you wanna follow me on TikTok, just a heads up, my main content on there is Critical Role and Dungeons and Dragons. It's very different content from what I do here, so just, Keep that in mind. Also, in general, thank you so much for supporting my channel. I'm actually, by the time I'm recording this, I just hit 400 subscribers and I'm like really, really excited that I'm actually recording something right after a milestone for this channel for once. So like, thank you so much. Um, I never expected anyone to really pay a ton of attention to this channel and I hope it just keeps happening because I'm having a lot of fun making these videos for you guys. And hopefully as time goes on, you'll get to see more and more and more impressive and cool projects that I'm working on uh, because I'm working on some big ones right now and hopefully they'll be out by the time you're seeing this. Anyway, have a great day. I hope you guys totally enjoyed uh, me talking about the Voltron fandom and my experiences in it. If you're part of the Voltron fandom and you experienced some of this stuff, I would love to hear down below, especially if you were maybe a former anti-shipper or you're even currently an anti-shipper. If you have a different opinion, I'm completely willing to hear it out. Um, just be nice to each other in the comments. Things could get really heated in fandom spaces and that's just not what I'm about here. So just as a heads up, if you do comment something really hurtful or harmful, I will remove the comments. I'm not going to be shy about it. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Have a great day. Um, I'm gonna go now. And this is the end of anti-shipping part one. So get ready for part two. Yeah.
Anyway, back to reading this script that I wrote that is far too long that I wish I had not made so long. So, so long. Okay.